Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we are happy to see some older faces and some newer faces for a very special event for the Mershon Center. Um, I am Dorothy Noyes, the director of the Mershon Center for International Security Studies at The Ohio State University, and we are here for a conversation between our special guest, Fiona Hill, and her former professor, our own Andreas Dorpelen, <laughs> professor of military history, and Mershon senior fellow, Jeffrey Parker, and we are deeply indebted to Jeffrey, without whose intercession this event would not have been possible. You are all here because you are already quite well aware of Fiona, Rep Fiona Hill's reputation as a specialist in foreign affairs, a Russia expert, and perhaps as a speaker of truth to power. She is a long-standing senior fellow of the Center uh, sorry, at the Center of the United States and Europe in the Foreign Policy Program of the Brookings Institution. She served as the Russia-Eurasia Officer at the U.S. National Intelligence Council during the G.W. Bush and the Obama administrations, and she served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Senior Director for European and Russian Affairs on the National Security Council during the lively years of 2017 to 2019. Later this afternoon, she'll be speaking from this expertise about the Ukraine war and the current geopolitics of Russia and its regions, but for this conversation, we'll be hearing a more personal take of the kind that many of you have encountered in her memoir, uh, There is Nothing for You Here, Finding Opportunity in the 21st Century. We have particularly invited Mershon's most junior affiliates to be in the room today, but even the oldest of us are still wrestling with the networked commitments that her book delineates, personal ambition, loyalty to place, and professional responsibility in a context of systemic inequities and institutional abdications. In the midst of all of this is the role of education, and I think Jeffrey's questions will focus on this in particular because Dr. Hill's example is of special interest to us at a school like Ohio State, where many of our students and many of our faculty are first-generation college and certainly first-generation PhDs. Just a few days ago, uh, Fiona Hill's commitment to educational access was recognized. She was named Chancellor of the University of Durham in her native region of northeastern England. So we're really pleased to have her here to help us reflect on our opportunities and our responsibilities in the academy. Please welcome Fiona and Well, here yes. we are again. <laughs> 30 years later, here we are again. And I was astonished when I read, there's nothing for you here, to see that there was a life before we met. Yes. Um, and <laughs> in that, you mention the study abroad programs that you went on at school. I wonder if you could start by saying um, how much you got from that. Where did you go uh, uh, and what did you learn? Yeah, and obviously the relevance um, of uh, all these study abroad uh, programs, you know, uh, very I'm sure uh, fits in for uh, everyone here. And by the way, I just want to say how thrilled I am to be here um, at Ohio State. This is a place I've wanted to come to for a very long time. Um, obviously, very storied university, and I'm very excited that I'm right by the football stadium because <laughs> everyone's always been telling me that this is the biggest football stadium there ever is, and you've got to see, you know, Ohio State football stadium before you die. Wrong I haven't been able to see it inside. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see it from my, my, my hotel window. So very exciting about that. So this is a bit like a study abroad as well, you know, when you get to the Ohio <laughs> yeah, State indeed, and football. Yes. Yeah, exactly, you know. I've always totally, felt Totally that. different world. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, growing up in, um, you know, a similar place to where many other people might uh, have done that uh, kind of got, got lost in sort of the sands of time, you know, kind of blowing past, um, you know, there weren't a lot of opportunities to even get outside of my region, um, you know, for s school trips, you know, occasionally where... You know, if any of you have been on a school trip when you were age 11, they're not exactly the most enjoyable things. You know, somebody pushing you down a flight of stairs, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, everyone screaming at each other, uh, the teachers telling you to shut up. And, you know, you kind of, those experiences are not, you know, not the best. And I discovered that um, my uh, local county council, my local education authority, um, despite the straitened times of, you know, being in one of these left behind places, which was really down its luck, had set aside in its uh, budget 
money for school exchanges from across the whole region. It's a very small region, of course. County Durham would probably fit into the stadium a couple of times <laughs> over because it's not, not big, Britain is not very big. And in fact, you know, the whole population of uh, Columbus uh, is probably about the whole size of uh, the um, uh, the north of England. But they'd actually set this for um, students. Uh, at, you know various ed groups from across the county, and you could you could just apply. And uh, I mean, it wasn't like a highly selective, <laughs> because a lot of times people weren't applying to go to these. People would say, "Well, why would I, you know, go on a trip?" But my parents had talked about, you know, when they were younger, saving up and going on trips. Um, in my mum's case, she'd been in the um, the Girl Scouts, the Girl Guides, and um, during World War Two, they had um, the Girl Guides have actually. Uh, taken in uh, girl guides from uh, occupied France, and they'd had a, uh, mm -hmm. a young girl staying with them whose family had you know, sent her out from uh, Paris. Uh, the family were partly Jewish and you know, were worried about their daughter Jacqueline, and the girl guides, had, uh, it's a you know, little known part of history, had actually, it wasn't exactly the kinder transport, mm -hmm. but they'd taken a lot of uh, girl guides from across Europe who were in harm and farmed them out on uh, various families. And, and then the French family had invited my mother to go to Paris in um, 1947. You know, so right after the war, and my mother, you know, at the time was 13, and it was just, she'd never forgotten that. And she wanted, you know, to, my sister and I to try to do something similar. Just, you know, open your eyes to something that you would never have expected. And I guess wartime or just immediately post-war Paris was probably a bit of a shock to the system, not just in, you know, the usual things one gets when you get in Paris, but this whole country in a city coming out of a really devastating uh, period of war and, and occupation. And my parents really encouraged me to go initially to Germany, you know, for the same reason, because a lot of these... Um, uh, exchanges were organised in the uh, very early fa phases of the UK being in the European Union, which of course it isn't in anymore. But in the 1970s, there was a, money went into exchanges. It was all part of that post World War II reconciliation across Europe. And my grandfather had fought in World War One all the way through from 1914 to 1918. He didn't have, let's just say, the most charitable uh, view of the Germans. Uh, my dad actually when he, he was quite scared to tell my father, uh, his father, that he'd signed me up uh, for this uh, <laughs> to, to go to Germany. Well, he actually called them the Bosch, and ironically, oh, the, oh, excuse me, excuse I was a Bosch me. fellow at uh, Brookings recently. <laughs> so I thought, how ironic, my granddad called them the Bosch, you know, kind of rather than the Hun. We can argue about those kind in, of In Nottingham, we call them Huns. Yes, and uh, for whatever reason, we call them the Bosch. This is obviously before everyone had Bosch appliances in their, <laughs> in their kitchens and things. And, and my granddad didn't speak to my dad for a couple of months and refused at first to meet the German exchange student who, you know, kind of replaced me as I went to there. But, you know, again, I mean, it's at this point, you know, 30 odd years after the end of the war, but it was, again, a huge revelation. And partly it's what got me interested in history and particularly European history, because as I talked to my exchange um, family, they had had this incredible experience as, as children that the parents were a bit younger than my parents um, and they'd been small children during the war and their family had uh, been displaced from Frankfurt during the Allied firebombing of Frankfurt. And they talked about seeing people incinerated you know, in front of them as they fled Frankfurt. And of course, I'd grown up you know, just reading you know, the regular histories and you know, thinking about all of the terrible things that Nazi Germany had done during World War II and I'd never heard as one would expect, particularly at age 13. I'd seen all the films of the Holocaust because one of my um, uh, local doctors had been um, in, uh, in the military, the British military, when they liberated Bergen-Belsen. And at age 11 and 12, he'd come and shown to just the first, uh, you know, the films to all the classes when you were age 11 and 12. He would come around the local schools and show the film that he'd, um, he'd taken. It was just horrifying and horrific. And of course, so my whole lens on Germany is through that perspective. And then suddenly I'm hearing human stories of people who'd, you know, were children. They weren't, you know, guilty of the war. But, of course, you know, they had suffered greatly. And they themselves had been having a long time trying to kind of figure out, you know, what this war was all about. And we had a lot of very frank conversations. And they were really welcoming me and took me all over um, Germany. And that was, for me, really the kind of the, the beginning. I also went to France later, uh, right in the middle of, um, in one of the uh, uh, Paris suburbs, the, these were all town twinning areas. I don't know where Columbus is uh, twinned with, but... Um, Dresden. Dresden. Well, there you are, a classic, <laughs> a classic example yeah. of it, yes. So, I mean, County Durham was twinned with one place in the Nordrhein-Westfalia because of the, um, you know, the Ruhr uh, coal mining. 
Uh, but we're also uh, twin because of Durham University with Tübingen, very different place. I mean, amazing, Tübingen and Heidelberg. You know, you couldn't be more different from the Lord Rhine Westphalia and, and Tübingen. I looked out by going to Tübingen, so a big, you know, kind of revelation. But then we were also twinned with some of the Paris industrial suburbs, in this case, Ivry-sur-Seine, which at that point was communist. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, there was a Renault factory there, and it was in the middle of the strikes. And I would have to go to school dodging Molotov cocktails. I didn't know what Molotov cocktails were until I got there. I was like, oh, what's that going over my head? Uh, and we would basically go off to the school meetings when there was this just huge manifestation and with kind of all the strikes. And again, I would think, you know, well, what, the Communist Party in France? You know, this was, I was also, uh, didn't know very much about it. And obviously the whole industrial labor movements, of course, this is you know, the period of the winters of discontent in the um, United Kingdom, but people weren't throwing Molotov cocktails with quite so much frequency. Because there were French, uh, let's just say, protests <laughs> were bigger, <laughs> larger, louder, and more fiery uh, than the things that I'd seen even in the, you know, the United Kingdom context at that point. So revelations in every front. And then I started getting interested in the international labour movements, what was going on here, you know, larger context. And so I think, you know, basically exchanges, they open your eyes, but they also raise a lot of questions. You know, when you're sort of 13 or 15, you know, as it was in these kinds of cases. I, I so had a lot this of makes you a historian. This. Exactly, it did make me a historian. And you come to St Andrews. You've got <laughs> your right. you've got German, you've got French, and then you, where did you go wrong? You went to decided <laughs> you decided to do Russia. How how come? Well, it's also the historical period, which you know I, I imagine there's a whole lot of people thinking about studying Russian now, and lots of universities wishing they hadn't got rid of their Russian studies programs. Indeed. <laughs> yes. and can they can they reinvest in them? Um, and it was. Um, you know, basically against the backdrop of the war scare of, uh, you know, the Euro missile crisis, which was 97 to 87. And, you know, 1977, I was 12. You know, it's so again in that period when I'm just about to go start going on some of these exchanges. And there's this just, well, you, you lived this it. This is a palpable, palpable uh, tension uh, there. And it, it mounts up as we get into the 1980s. And in 1983 in um, Europe, there was a definite, um, after the Able Archer exercises in the United States where you know, Ronald Reagan did want to scare the Soviets but in the sense of deterrence by you know, launching this series of exercises. But the whole point was like, this could happen if. But the Soviets at the time obviously read it as, oh my God, this is about to happen. The United States is preparing for an invasion or a first nuclear strike. And of course, that wasn't the intent at all. And although again, you know, I'm a, a teenager and I don't realize that that's the dynamic. You feel at that, at that point in the United Kingdom and elsewhere in Europe that we're on the brink of a nuclear war and we could very well have been. And in November of 1983, we came extraordinarily close, just like with the Cuban Missile Crisis um, 60 years ago. And there's actually a podcast, uh, you know, kind of that's just um, uh, come out on snafus of great kind of mistakes of history and Abel Archer and 1983 is one of them. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I, I find out a lot of this later in time when I'm at the National Intelligence Council, I actually look at some of the archival material to find out if we really were actually extraordinarily close. But it was that experience, that feeling of being on the verge of nuclear war that starts to get me interested in the Soviet Union and, and Russia and trying to understand what happened. But I had no idea about, you know, how I would answer these questions. And then on one occasion, um, my, my father... Uh, and, and I were in our town. We didn't have a telephone or a you know, TV, actually, a lot of this period. And you know, we were mostly listening to some of the stuff, this stuff on the radio and you know, reading about it in the papers. And we ran into one of my um, father's older cousins, who I knew was Uncle Charlie. And Uncle Charlie had had one of these crazy lives that you think he's just making it up, like Walter Mitty. You know, he's, kind of, he's got all these large tales about fighting the Spanish Civil War, we go, yeah, Uncle Charlie. You know, kind of basically all these things about being um, in World War II and his ship gets sunk in the Mediterranean, he gets blown up with depth charges. It's like something out of a Hollywood movie and we'd all go, yeah, yeah, Uncle Charlie. Nobody, it turns out later that all these things are true. But it just seems so preposterous for some old man, you know, retired, you know, former, you know, worker, former miner, you know, sitting around in uh, the north of England of having these crazy stories of his youth. And anyway, we, we, we see him in the town, and um, he's been, you know, obviously really worried about everything here and my dad and uh, here talking about it. And <coughs> Uncle Charlie looks at, looks at me and he says, well, Fiona, you're good at languages. Maybe you should go and study Russian and figure out why the Soviets are trying to bloody well blow us up. And I was like, 
And that was oh, it. Yeah, I could, I could do that. I, but, and, then I, and then I thought, but how do I do that? <laughs> and, then, and, and, then, and then Uncle Charlie told me that they were actually um, uh, funding for fellowships from the local Durham Miners Association. And this, we're running into the whole period here of um, the miners' strike of 1984-1985, uh, oh, yeah. which is the, you know, the period that I come to St Andrews. Yes. And That's it, your first it, year. It, it was my first year. But it turns out that the uh, miners around the world had sent money to the Durham miners in solidarity because the Durham Miners Association had ties with the Donbass region of then the Soviet Union, now the contested area in Ukraine, going back to the 1920s when they'd had miners' exchanges. And it's just kind of fascinating, entire miners' families, their wives, and all go on these exchanges. I mean, obviously a lot of propaganda on the, you know, the Soviet period. So anybody studying Soviet studies, you know, very interesting period of the, you know, the solidarity of workers' movements. And it was intended to create a very positive impression of the Soviet Union because people would be shown these show mines in the Donbass, which were all gleaming. Even the coal was polished, you know, kind of, uh, to, you know, no dust and you know, all the rest of it. And everybody turned out in their, you know, their, their, their very best clothes, you know, making it look like... You know, some fabulous um, socialist of, paradise. Uh, like socialist <laughs> paradise, exactly. Although I think after a while the Durham miners cottoned on that it wasn't all that great. <laughs> but it was um, those linkages had persisted through into the you know the more modern times, and um, money was sent from the miners' unions to be used you know to help uh, the children of miners. And there was a, a small educational fund, and Uncle Charlie tells my dad about it. It turns out I was the only applicant, because I was supposed to be the only person who knew about it. And um, I, I got the, um, a, a small amount of funding, and it was about £100, which at the time was actually an enormous amount of funding yeah. from my perspective, to um, take the Norwich Russian course in the summer before I came to St Andrews, because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to um, study Russian, because I had to have some basic grounding in Russian language before I came. What was the advantage of the St Andrews system that, that you didn't just do your major? I mean, any, any English university, you do one yeah, subject. I, yeah, you wouldn't, and I wouldn't but have been Scotland, able to do it in a, a, a British, an English university, right. but the St Andrews I was able to. So the problem with learning a language, I find, is how do you keep it up? I mean, when you were at St Andrews from time to time, I would slip away to Spain, but I would have to engage a tutor beforehand yeah. to get the language up. What, how do you keep up? It's really difficult, actually, uh, to be honest. And um, I, I think I was mentioning to you the other day that one of my language instructors said language is like a knife. And that, you know, if you use it all the time, it stays nice and sharp. But if you put it in a drawer, it becomes really blunt. And that's really going to take a lot of effort to sharpen it again. I thought it was a great image. And I, of course, have not been keeping it up in the way that uh, that language instructor would have wanted it to be. But I do, um, you know, try to, I mean, the great thing now um, is just of the sort of ubiquity of, uh, of information that's out there. And I do, from, you know, time to time, spend a lot of time watching YouTube. Uh, and it, uh, but of Russian, it, <coughs> unless they, I mean, I've spent a lot of time looking at Vladimir Putin's speeches, uh, which, uh, you know, for my many sins, and, you know, sometimes they, you know, addle the brain. But there is a lot of opportunity to uh, watch, con you know, contemporary you know, discussions. I, I uh, pick up on some, you know, like Russian media on right. YouTube. I don't subscribe to, you know, the channels again that will rot your brain. You know, kind of like a, an incredible diet of, you know, basically Russian channels of uh, official channels of television. But you know, from time to time, going in and you know, watching a couple of hours of things. It's you know, I use it for work as well to kind of see what what are people saying. But you know, I have to say that um, there's nothing beats being in the country. And, right. uh, and that's going to be a dilemma for everybody, you know, working in, uh, on Russia and studying Russian now. Although there are hundreds of thousands of Russians in places like Kazakhstan, um, just newly moved there. And I think, you know, there are many other places that we can, you know, kind of go and, you know, basically engage. But I, it, is, it is hard to keep up a language. And I right. think that, you know, I mean, some people are much more rigorous than you know, I am and, and ought to be. Well, you went there for a year, didn't you? I, I did, mean, and after... that's what made a huge difference. Tell us a little bit about that well, it was and, 19... and what you learned from it. Well, it was 1987, mm -hmm. and again, I was very grateful um, to St Andrews at the time because they helped me identify this programme. So it's, it was kind of like the equivalent of, you know, we've got IREX in the United States, which is the International Research and Exchange Board, but also then the FLAS programmes, and then all the other kind of, you know, programmes where you can get language uh, study abroad. And this was the very, uh, you know, kind of lengthy named Russian Language Undergraduate Study Committee program, uh, where you could have a, a year in um, uh, the Soviet Union at the time. It was administered under the British Council. 
I mean, in this case, you did have to, you know, kind of apply, and your university had to nominate you. And there was a kind of a limited number of places, you know, depending on the size of the uh, Russian department at the university. Now, St Andrews's wasn't very big, uh, but there was only one place. But fortunately for me, nobody else wanted to go for the year. So I have got a lot of luck where other people have decided not to apply for these things too. Sometimes it's just a question of showing up because, you know, kind of a lot of people don't know the opportunities are there. And I'm not sure that everybody in my program knew that there was a year-long opportunity because there was for German and French and Spanish and right. Portuguese, and but, but the Portuguese wasn't taught very often, Italian, I think, as well. Mm. But most of the people studying Russian at St Andrews would go for just the one one semester for like a three, or maybe sometimes it was a six-month program. Why did you choose the year? Because I felt that, first of all, my Russian would improve because my Russian was not very good. And um, I should tell you about some of the crazy mistakes I was making at that point because I'd really just you know started as I was going into St Andrews and it was pretty hard slog. That learning a language you know, from scratch as a you know, young adult is still hard even though your brain theoretically is still wired <laughs> for the language. I didn't feel like it was at the time. And um, it was also, I, I kind of wanted to have more of an immersion um, experience, really try to understand. And I felt like, you know, as we all do, right, three months, six months, those kind of pass really quickly. But, you know, a year. And I didn't realise at the time what a momentous year it was going to be. Because I, mean, I basically got there in the fall of 1987. That's exactly when Gorbachev and Reagan signed the INF Treaty, ending the Euro missile crisis. Yeah. Unfortunately, I was in the government when we got out of the INF Treaty. So that's another irony of history. <laughs> but anyway, moving right along from that one. Um, it was uh, then the beginning of... Do you of, take of sole that, credit for this, Fiona? No, 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 no. I just think it's one of those. It's like, you know, kind of the, um, the whole, um, you know, just being a bystander in history sometimes. You know, you're kind of on one of these trains that kind of goes around in a circle looking at them and go, hang, hang, hang on, I'm just there. Um, but, but you weren't entirely a bystander. Were no, you? I wasn't. I wasn't entirely a bystander. Well, the, the first it, time. Well, the first time um, that was how I ended up then getting to the United States and writing to you about it. We've got a whole pack of the letters mm, I wrote. Yes, dear, yes, dear yes, Professor yes, Parker, yes, yes, you know you're in the United States now. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think? But um, it was basically the whole rise of the Gorbachev Reagan symmetry, and so I ended up. You know, because I stayed for a year, um, being there for the Gorbachev Reagan summit at Moscow in 1988. And I mean, what, a, what an amazing event. Mm -hmm. And although I was a bystander, I wasn't quite a bystander because they were looking for people who could um, speak English to work as stringers, runners, coffee makers, you know, extraordinaire for the, all the, uh, the news uh, uh, companies, ABC, NBC. That's back in the day when there were only a few companies, you know, kind of coming and then the BBC. And they were all pulled together. And there weren't that many um, English-speaking foreign students. And there certainly weren't enough Americans for all of the, uh, or Canadians for all of the uh, TV companies. And, you know, I, uh, <laughs> it was kind of ironic, though, because I did have a pretty, as you might remember, thick County Durham accent at the time. Really? And, and when I first went to the interview, the Americans said, are you speaking English? Yeah. <laughs> said, yes. Don't worry, I get the same in Spain. It's like, you know. a totally funky accent here. And they said, how about you hairspray Tom Brocko's hair? And I was like, OK, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to make coffee for Maria Shriver. But I did get to do some you know, other things as well. But I was like, the, but it actually turned out to be fortuitous because, you know, I, I've told this story before that um, I was sent to make coffee for Maria Shriver. And, you know, I come from the north of England at this point. And our idea of coffee... <laughs> <laughs> What we it's used like, to call Nescaf. Like a little yeah. jar of Nescaf. You yeah, stick your spoon yeah, in, you put it in, and I'm like going, where's the spoon? There? What's that? So there's the drip coffee machine. I'm fine, I'd never seen one before. And I was like, there's a piece of paper. Yeah. There's this thing. And I was like standing there. And then I started kind of thinking I was making it. And I just made a mess. I had to put the paper in because I didn't know what it was for. Yeah. So I just put the coffee in the top. <laughs> What's written? There's a burning smell, and I burnt myself trying to clean it up. And then suddenly this man comes in, and I'm like, like this, you know, deer in the headlights with all this burnt stuff and coffee all over the place. And I'm thinking, this isn't working. And he said, what are you doing? Who are you? When I said, explained I was a stupid British student. I, I knew how to make tea, uh, and I knew how to spoon out Nescafe. And I didn't know what this was. And he's like, good God, you know, and I starts, you know, fixing it all up and while well, I clean up. And it turned out that um, I only later found out it was Bob Legvold, Professor Legvold from Columbia University. I didn't get his name when he came in because I was so embarrassed about the whole coffee. But he was, said he was a friend of Tom Brocko's. I hoped he wouldn't tell him about my mess that I made. Um, 
and otherwise I'd have to spray him in the eyes or something. <laughs> um, and uh, he um, starts suddenly asking me uh, questions about, you know, what am I doing? You know, coming to the end of the, my time, and what was I thinking about doing next? And I said, well, I'd been thinking about, you know, maybe going to the US to do some study, but I had no idea, you know, kind of this is about my, I start to, you know, write to you. And um, he told me that there was all these scholarships. And I said, oh, yeah, how do you, how do you apply? <laughs> uh, and he told me to go to the uh, cultural section of the British Embassy, and then they would help me connect, because I couldn't just show up at the American Embassy, but they, they would help me connect with the cultural attaché at the American Embassy. So I, I dutifully did that, and it turned out that the cultural attaché there, who was in his first posting with the British Council, a gentleman named Michael Bird, he had just been at Harvard, at the Russian Research Center the year previously, mm -hmm. on um, a, a, a Knox or a Kennedy uh, fellowship, which is one of the ones I uh, eventually applied for. You talk about a coincidence. Mm -hmm. And so this was his first posting after you know, finishing this up because he joined the <coughs> British Council immediately afterwards. And he said, oh, well, I can, I can help you apply and I'll get the materials for you from, you know, I'm having tea or something with the American, uh, and I'll tell about this. But when you go back, you must talk to your university about it, about St. Andrews. And that's... Then when I come back and I write, dear Professor Parker, you're in America now. Do you know about all these uh, fellowships? Would and I've actually... heard about these, you know, kind of yeah. what do I do? You do, yes, yes, you said, yeah. But what I remember in one of these letters He's kept is, them all because he's a historian. Yeah, I'm a historian. Yeah. 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 What did I write, you know? It's like, a, oh, no, I did remember that, writing, but I was like... One, a... one of the things you said was that you just spent a year in Russia and now you wanted to go to America to see the other side. Yeah, because and it, it was in the terrific. Cold War, you know, the whole, you know, the standoff. And I realized I knew nothing about America. I mean, I'd spent a lot of time watching Starsky and Hutch and Miami Vice and, you know, got on television, <laughs> Dynasty or Dynasty. You know, because we, we got some really crap television, you know, exported to us, you know, from, uh, I mean, you probably just didn't bother, you know, oh, watching any of that. No, no, you wouldn't have possibly done that. You know, kind of uh, the old, old Westerns. I knew an awful lot about John Wayne and, you know, all kinds of... Uh, Bonanza. You know, uh, but, oh, yeah, oh, Bonanza. Yeah, Bonanza. Right, Bonanza sorry, well, excuse kind me. Of Saturday yes. morning. Oh, you, you did watch them. But, you know, when we realised a very superficial understanding of, you know, the, the United States, and, and I'd sat in on some of the interviews with NBC News and Tom Brocker when I wasn't spraying his hair, he was interviewing people like George Shultz. And I said, like, George Shultz? Carlucci, Frank Carlucci, Frank Carlucci. You know, so I, looked, I couldn't look them up on Wikipedia or anything at the time. I'd have to go and ask somebody and say, who's this? You know, kind of, and you know, I had no idea. And I, I knew who Ronald Reagan was. And I heard Ronald Reagan's speech at Moscow State University because I was along with one of the camera crews. Right. And um, they sent me off to uh, help them, I mean, I you know, could facilitate all these meetings with Russians because my Russian was obviously more understandable than my English to the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we did, we did uh, you know, uh, Russians playing basketball and uh, baseball. I knew nothing about basketball and baseball at this point. Nobody in the UK played basketball no. or baseball. So I was like... We well, played you know, what to, football. We did football, football yes, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that was kind of a, a, such a revelation. I thought, gosh, I know nothing about America. I mean, I, I had this uncle who'd emigrated in the 1920s and 30s. He'd actually jumped ship. So he was kind of a legal immigrant in the New York docks. But we won't talk about that. <laughs> anyway, that was, that, those were back in the days before World War II. And, um, you know, he'd write to us, you know, every, every year and send us a few dollars in a card. And I was saving them up for, <laughs> for going to America. I was stashed away, you know, kind of in a sock somewhere in the back of my drawer. Um, but, you know, I'd never, I just couldn't envisage being there. And I didn't know how to get there. I hadn't, you know, kind of the money to go and visit. And I knew you could do some of these, you know, scholarships where BUNAC, the British Universities, North America, um, the system where people come and work in summer camps and things like that. But I kind of apparently missed the boat for that. You had to still be enrolled in the university by the time I thought about it. So it was the so a postdoc. Post, yeah, yeah. Which or you, kind of masters. Uh, you get yeah. offered one at Penn, if I recall, and right. then one at where's that other place? Oh, uh, Harvard. Uh, Harvard, person, Harvard yeah. yes. But Harvard. that was the, that was the, but that was the shock because you know I I I did not know American universities either, and you know you can talk to a lot of people from around the world, people in the United States as well that just don't know the names of uh, universities. Yeah, I'm sure many of you have you know had that same experience. I mean, particularly if you're first generation in your family to even go to, you know, to college, undergrad, to so think about then secondary education. And my dad said, are you not applying to Yale? And I said, well, is there a scholarship to Yale? And, my dad, and I said, 
what do you know about Yale, Dan? He said, well, I read about him, The Great Gatsby. And I was like... <laughs> <laughs> I, said, well, I, I don't know whether they have a Russian department, Dad. I don't know. I mean, I was told that Harvard has one. He said, well, I haven't heard of Harvard. <laughs> so I, go, good, I said, well, good. I'm not told it's actually all right. You know, and they've got, but they've got fellowship. They've got a scholarship. And then there was University of Pennsylvania did. Because right. you'd, you'd also given me advice to look for the places that had... And you, you told me about uh, yeah, go, uh, go for uh, the five, five. places that have money, yeah, and yep. you gave me five, you know, different uh, places. I also said, you know, yeah. there's nothing for you there, Pat. Because, yeah, exactly. Because you told me some Britain, of the places it wouldn't work for postgrad education in Russia and America was the place to go. Yeah, I mean, because this is the irony, and I, I, I mentioned this, you know, at lunch that um, unless you got a first, you, there was no chance of getting the next funding no. to go on to uh, get the money for a PhD, and I'd. Um, well, I thought I was kind of branching out, so I'd done Russian and modern history, which were, you know, two separate subjects, but I'd done it as a joint honours. And I got a first in history, but I got a 2-1 in Russian. And so, you know, you had to have an overall first, which was not so easy to... And I'd spent a year in Russia, and actually right. I'd, I'd set myself back because they changed the curriculum while I was away. And when I came back, they're like, I'm sorry we changed the curriculum, because it wasn't geared up for somebody who'd spent a year abroad. Right. And... I was like, okay. Yeah, well, you've been to Russia. To, why would that well, help you with the yeah, Russian well, degree? Well, Russian degree, right. exactly. Yes. Yeah. These so I was then thinking to myself, well, I won't get the funding for the um, for the UK. You know, and, so and I said, hence, go uh, to the Professor US. Parker said, yeah. come to the US. Go west, young woman. So um, you do all this education. You're obviously undervaluing the fact that you put in a lot of hours. How did it help you in your professional education? Uh, well, your career after that. All these, all these hours at yeah. school, university, postgrad. How did they help you? Well, look, I wouldn't be doing any of the things I'm doing without that. I mean, obviously, I wouldn't. I mean, I wouldn't have studied Russian in the first instance, so that would have been that. So that's the point. That did take a lot of, a lot of work. But I, I was um, always brought up on the idea that education was a privilege, right? Well, because it wasn't something that everybody had, and if you had the chance in education, then you should do something with it. Now, of course, we all do something with education, I mean, teaching, researching. Yeah. But there was also the idea that it was a kind of a tool, um, not just for you individually, but for other people as well. Uh, that, I mean, that's something that I think has really shifted since the 1980s in the United States and in the United Kingdom elsewhere, that there's a larger societal benefit from people being educated. If you looked at the, both the United States and the United Kingdom, it was something I, I wrote about in the book because it was something that really struck me. At, at certain periods in time, we've, we've been... You know, taken with the idea that uh, as large a group of the population being educated as possible is actually in the best interest of the country. And I think we're at one of those phases now where that's just not the case. And I think that's you know, part of the result of uh, other roots of our polarisation and fracturing, because people yep. don't believe that education in any form um, is for them. But that's not the environment that I grew up in or the environment that you no. grew up in in the UK. And it's not the environment that my husband you know, is the same age and his family grew up in either. My husband's one of 12, the family originally from South Dakota. Um, his father um, was actually the first from the farm to go um, uh, to uh, college in, um, at Wesleyan University of South Dakota. And he hitchhiked from his farm because his father had died and he was still in charge of the farm and all of his siblings and his mother. And he hitchhiked from the farm every day to take classes and hitchhike back again. And it, but it was also part of the whole funding after World War II, the GI Bill. He hadn't been in the war, but he still benefited from that expansion of education. And the whole idea was that he was getting educated to help farmers. So he became a, um, a, a chemist for food products. And actually, he invented all kinds of ways of using shellac, <laughs> which I, I always kind of find it quite amusing. But it's not just you know making your apples all nice and waxy and shiny. There's all kinds of... He had some like 36 patents for corn products. I don't think he was responsible for, you know, that high sugary contact corn. <laughs> stuff, yeah. but, but it was kind of, he was trying to do something with it, you know. So it was kind of the whole idea was that his education was instrumental to figure out how farmers would have more um, opportunity for revenue generation from, from corn. It was kind of a, an obviously utilitarian um, education. But he also then wanted every single one of his 12 children to have an education and every one of my um, husband's siblings got a Pell Grant. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that was kind of, again, that's the sort of the, the, you know, the 70s and the 80s. And the whole idea was that you know, our largest society would benefit from that. You're a product of the grammar school yep. uh, education. Britain in 1919, just at the end of World War I, passed this, this massive education bill. 
trying to expand education also for adults under the uh, idea that you know that a country would benefit from having continuous education in a well informed well educated population as a way of recovering yeah. from world war 1 and then there was a similar expansion of education after world war 2 yep. which we all benefited from in the 60s and the 70s and then in the 80s it's suddenly thought of education as being just an individual benefit <coughs> and so for I mean, all of you here born in the 80s onwards, I'm so sorry. Because, I mean, all of us beforehand actually got a major assist. Um, I didn't have any um, educational debt. Um, no, I, I was paid for I. by my local yep. education authority. Yep. And although um, the grammar school system in the UK had disappeared, so the selective education had gone, but the idea of the comprehensive schools was kind of basically expanding out education. And then since then, I think, you know, debt and that kind of... I know we're having a big battle about... Um, forgiveness of debt right now with the Biden administration and all the various local courts. But the same thing is happening in the United Kingdom about a, a debate about yep. student debt and you know the kind of then the obstacles and the barriers to entry. Because I, I think if I was now uh, in the same position that I was when you know we first met, I wouldn't have gone to university or college because I couldn't imagine taking on debt because I'd be worried about paying it back. And I think that that kind of people miss that that it has becomes a a barrier to entry for people who are the, the first in their families thinking about going to college and whose parents don't have any money. And the idea that you would be, I, I, know, I certainly wouldn't have studied Russian. I mean, there were all kinds of subjects you just would not study. Right. And so, I, and so I think, you know, kind of, I, I, I feel that, you know, many of the reasons for talking about this and writing about it is to kind of open up that whole discussion about education. About the, mm -hmm. and, and, and making education accessible for larger groups. And this is obviously what Ohio State does. I mean, just a huge university here. But there is now a big debate about what the value of education is. And it's not obviously just elite education, you know, Ivy League schools or the big state schools, but vocational education, lifelong education. Britain had a whole tradition of further education colleges, a great uh, um, tradition here in the United States of community colleges, many of which have been closed, you know, over uh, the last uh, several years. There's another aspect, though, isn't there, and that is an anti-intellectualism, or yeah. so say anti-intellectualism. You remember Michael Gove, yeah. uh, who briefly uh, surfaces in the cabinet in the UK from he's, time to he's time. He's back again. Yeah. I know, I know. But just before <laughs> Brexit, he said, we've had enough of experts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. An expert uh, himself. Yeah, how do you yeah, deal yeah. with that? How do you deal with the fact? I mean, you are an expert. Do you ever come across this? I do. I have enough people say, so what makes you an expert then? And I, I, well, you have a good I, answer I, I, to I, that. I, yeah, yeah, then I do talk about, look, it, it's, it's just like, you know, being a doctor or an airline pilot or a firefighter. You know, you're actually focusing on a particular subject and really learning it in depth. And, you know, if you were getting on a plane, you would want to think that your pilot was an expert in flying the plane? You know, or you're going you to see the, L and R on the gloves, yeah, you so, begin yeah, to worry. Yeah, exactly. You begin to worry, yeah, exactly. Yes. And if you're going you know, to have surgery, you want to have your doctor to be an expert. There's all kinds of procedures. You wouldn't want your doctor to be doing it for the first time. And all that works in other fields of life as well. You know, if you're learning a language, you need to be expert in the language. Otherwise, you could do what my dad does, which is just shout at everyone, assume they're deaf. You know, <laughs> that's what my dad used to do in his kind of, you know, the typical <laughs> British man's approach to a foreigner. They're just deaf. And so <laughs> I just need to shout at them. Uh, <laughs> No, that doesn't work. Off. She's elaborate, not joking. Elaborate hand <laughs> gestures. It's, it's, you know, it's true. Like, uh, yes, okay. Which, of course, actually is... Especially is, is, is male. A, there's a reason for why a lot of, you know, um, uh, in, um, you know, the, the, many of you who study Russian know that the word for German, Niemitz, is actually from somebody who is deaf and dumb. Yeah. Right. A person who cannot speak. I suppose Germans were the first people in Canada to assume that they couldn't you can speak. But it's a kind of a typical, it happens a lot in a foreign language that the, the person who doesn't speak is just obviously, yeah. <laughs> has got problems, so you just call them, you know, by some derogatory well, isn't, name. Isn't the uh, Moscow area where all the foreigners are concentrated in the, where I live, the 17th century, isn't it called the Numskull area? Yes, it was. Basically, all the, you know, they are the, the, they had the, uh, the, the Gostini Dvor as well, they kind of, where the guests were, they all confined them because you didn't want those foreigners, you know, running off. Mm -hmm. But very typical in Britain as well, when we can look yeah. at, uh, at other so people. as well. How do we deal with it, this hate of experts? I think part of it, um, you know, for universities is opening up the doors and, you know, getting people in, um, you know, from all kinds of different backgrounds, engaging with high schools, you know, community colleges. In the old days, um, in the UK, so my dad being a, a coal miner, the Miners Association used to have lecture series 
and unions used to do that here as well. And I think a lot of the, um, you know, the breakdown of the old style unions, and I'm not talking about industrial action and, you know, kind of going on strike, but they had, uh, uh, again, why did I, I got my money from the Durham Miners Association to study Russian, because there was the, I mean, it wasn't particularly um, artfully described, but it was, it was part of the betterment program. People wanted to better themselves. Now, that sounds ridiculous and kind of slightly, you know, kind of, strange when people think about that now but the whole idea was why could not a worker um, uh, learn the same thing as anybody else you could be a bricklayer and be you know extremely interested in ancient Rome so why couldn't you go on an evening and go to a lecture about ancient Rome why couldn't you actually not do you know course of study and the unions used to facilitate that and, uh, and although it wasn't cr spread throughout the whole country but in London there was a real richness of these workers further education colleges yep. Burbeck city city lit where you could go and study literature those things still exist but they're not very well funded and that used to be the idea of community colleges and you know kind of the, the unions would organize educational programs for their members and all their families so when my um, father-in-law for example went to work for international corn products as a chemist um, the, um, the his company paid for part of the education of the kids out of the company money, but they matched the Pell Grants. And the unions used to do that as well. He wasn't in the union because he was one of the, you know, the chemists working for the company, but the unions uh, for Kellogg's and you know, various other places did this as well. And we've kind of lost that. We expect either the government to pay or the individual to pay. And it, again, rather than thinking that we get the enrichment of all of our you know, society by giving people the opportunity to study things and making them see that there's nothing uh, basically, it's kind of, I think sometimes, it's hard to articulate this in a way, because sometimes education seems threatening in, in some respects. Um, you're studying kind of things that will rip you away from, you know, your traditional roots. That wasn't really the case when I was, and again, growing up in those old worker circles. There wasn't kind of a feeling that, you know, somehow you were going to become estranged you know, from your family, the grammar school system did mm -hmm. do that. But for the workers, it was kind of an enrichment. It was like, why shouldn't we learn the same thing as anybody else? It was kind of countering right. equality and uh, uh, inequality rather. And we had the, the um, emergence of the open university yep. and retraining and reskilling. And it's something that the United States really needs. I think universities can play a role. I mean, there are extension schools and programs engaging with businesses and workplaces and schools, but it might take, you know, a lot of effort from... Uh, universities themselves to do this so it's kind of one of the things I'm trying to think myself and you know this new role it's not a new role I and mean, he's always been chancellors of Durham University going back to the 1830s but I'm hoping that by having a platform I'll be able to talk about this and one of the things that's happening um, back in Durham uh, in the um, early 1900s the Durham miners didn't have a vote because they didn't have the tax they didn't pay taxes because they didn't have enough money and you know they were um, they didn't have a voice so they pooled their um, union or their association dues, first of all, to create the Durham Miners Association, but then to create a parliament. They actually built themselves a parliament in Durham City. It's called Red Hills, the Pittman's Parliament. You can look it up on, online. And my great grandfather was one of the spokesmen there from one of the you know, pit villages. They elected people uh, from the, the various pits in the villages to go and uh, represent them in the parliament. And it was like kind of decked out almost like a church or a, all the pews for each of the pits. And this was the kind of the origins of the, um, the Durham Miners Association and then the Miners Union. But it was very you know, egalitarian. And they um, basically debated all, all these big issues and tried to have a, a voice in, and it was open just as World War I came along, a voice in all the big debates that uh, were relevant to them. Right. Now that's kind of fallen by the wayside, but there's now an effort to um, refurbish the uh, the Pittman's Parliament and open it up to children and youth groups and the public and become a debating place about how do you deal with left behind places that, uh, um, and, and how they can have a voice again and a stake in what's happening and research into these kinds of topics. So I mean those kinds yeah. of town halls and debating places, the kind of ideas of people's parliaments, um, you know we used to have them in the United States, there's a lot of you know, research on, on this as well but we've kind of just sort of lost the plot. Can I press you a little further? I mean, when we first met, I lived in the 16th century. Yes, you did. And, yeah, and <laughs> I, I taught in a university, and here we are, you were a student, and now I'm still living in the 16th century, and I still teach, and you've sort of moved on. So, you know, what should we be doing in academia? What, what, would you, what advice would you, do you have for us? 
to make ourselves a little more relevant, especially those of us who look at security studies? What should we be thinking about? What should we be working well, on? Well, it's really about engagement, but it's looking for ways to engage. I mean, obviously, having the centre, the Merchant Centre, this is, you know, one way of uh, doing this. Um, <clears throat> thinking about, um, you know, how you can get out there and talk to different groups, community colleges. Everybody can do this. Students, peer-to-peer -peer groups, you know, going back to your high school, um, going back to, you know, local areas. Um, engaging with uh, World Affairs Councils, for example. I mean, one of the things that, uh, and they've got a great one, you know, I've basically, uh, we've got loads of them um, out in um, Ohio. I've um, spent a lot of time over the last year going to World Affairs Councils all over the country, sometimes by Zoom, because you can't, there's a lot of places that it's just, you know, quite difficult to get to and it's hard to, you know, be on the road every, every single uh, day. But I was trying to find out ways in which you can engage with the issues that you work on to make them, you know, more relevant for people now. I mean, the 16th century is actually a great way of talking about the present. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't stop now. No, it's true. <laughs> I mean, it's your, your whole you know, book about that great catastrophe. Uh, uh, Professor Parker always reminds me that everything you know, basically goes back to the 1660s. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's kind of a, I'm glad he, you learned something he, from me. He's got me. a point. Yes. You know, yes. we, we have had similar seemingly catastrophic <laughs> uh, uh, yep. epochs and where we've come out of them, including climate. Uh, just a few million earlier. dead, that's yeah, the that, problem, Fiona. That, yes, yeah. I, I didn't want to. I was <laughs> the last time round. No. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. and we're, we're already there now, yep. sadly. Yes. But uh, there, is, there is a lot to be literally learned from, from the past. And as I said, you know, the, the environment which I grew up is how do you apply the knowledge that you, that you have you know, in, in the present? You know, how do you use it? How do you, how do you get out there? Anyway, we've probably been wittering on for... No, I, I, can, I could listen to you forever. <laughs> but, but I think the audience may have some questions. Uh, one thing, actually, I do want to uh, say, because I have Professor Parker here, is that um, I would not be able to write and articulate in the, the way that I can now if it had not been for Professor Parker, because he ran a, um, a, a sort of study group uh, at St Andrews on, on writing. And the challenge was always writing and explaining things you didn't know anything about. Mm. Uh, and I was, um, as I wasn't working on the 16th century, this was kind of why I was paired with you, and the whole challenge was to be oh, able to... Oh, you want a quiz for you? Yeah, no, I don't. No, 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 no. And it was, he would send you something that he'd worked on, but that you knew nothing about at all, and then see, you know, after you know, a short period, whether you were able to explain it, and it was actually a great exercise. Thank you. You talk a little bit more about the being in Russia in the, in the 80s, um, 90, uh, yeah. Yeah, the 80s, and, uh, yeah. Uh, what was their attitude toward NATO enlargement? Just the general attitude of people you talked to at the time. Yeah, so it's been the Yeltsin period, right? Uh, no, well, well, I was there first in the Soviet period under oh, Gorbachev, yeah, well, which time, you know, NATO was obviously the, the main opponent. But then I was there through the 90s and then, you know, off and on, you know, throughout the 2000s as well. I mean, I spent a lot of time there in the 90s and uh, 2000s. And look, I think, you know, the, if you're thinking about that um, Yeltsin period, the time when NATO really becomes a standout issue is the bombing of Belgrade uh, against the backdrop of uh, the Balkan Wars and, of course, the uh, genocide ethnic cleansing in uh, Kosovo. If you go up to the kind of earlier period, you know, uh, later 1990s, when we had the Partnership for Peace, which was the uh, arrangement that was sort of set up so that former Soviet uh, republics, including Russia and Eastern European countries, could engage with NATO, but there wasn't a membership perspective, Russia was quite enthusiastic uh, about engagement with NATO at that point, or Russians were, let's say. There was a lot of Russian military went to places like garmisch Patenkirchen to the, you know, the, the Marshall School, you know, they're engaged with some of our um, uh, educational institutions in you know, the United States, the kind of war colleges, you know, for example. I went on actually for some period after that. But 1999 and the bombing of Belgrade is really the, the turning point. Because up until then, you know, we'd of course been making the case, which you know, is still true, that NATO was a defensive alliance and that we would only engage in a military um, conflict or any kind of military intervention if there had been an attack on a NATO country, Article 5. And then from the Russian perspective, here we were bombing Belgrade, 
but there hadn't been an attack on a NATO member. There'd been no Article 5. And of course, we were trying to explain that this, I'm saying we writ large, but I, I happened to be at a conference at the time with a whole host of American generals, former generals, and run by the, the Kennedy School I was working at the time, Professor Graham Allison. And every Russian acted just with shock. We were in St. Petersburg and we were there during the whole bombing. And they, they, they couldn't get their head around it, and we did a very bad job of explaining that this space was just was a NATO mission, but it wasn't a proper NATO mission. It was using the NATO umbrella because it was, you know, um, we were trying to use our coordination, and this was um, not a full on NATO intervention. It was obviously not very well explained uh, because you couldn't really explain it in that context. And we were trying to say that this was NATO, but it wasn't NATO. Not, it, was, it was just very inartful, and obviously. The Russians went away from that moment thinking, no, NATO is an offensive alliance and that it, NATO could be used at any point. And all the Russians, it didn't matter you know, what their particular um, affiliation was or their views of the West, uh, basically said to us, so could you bomb us? And of course, we kept saying, no, no, we couldn't. And this was the war in Chechnya had uh, broken out again. And so, well, why wouldn't you then do the same thing uh, is happening um, with Serbia over Kosovo, with Russia over Chechnya. And again, as I said, that, that, that is really, the, that, I think, the key turning point in the way that people like Putin and many other Russians start to see NATO in a different light. And we didn't engage with it in a way that, you know, I think we kind of missed the point that there'd been a complete shift in the way that many Russians thought about NATO then. And we kept on thinking, well, they've got to understand, of course, that um, it's still a totally defensive alliance and that they shouldn't worry at all that this NATO at any time would be a threat to them. How, how widespread was it, including you know, Western-oriented liberals? Versus... It was completely widespread, that's what I was saying, because we had at the, the conference that we were at, we were co-organizing um, it with Grigory Yavlinsky, who at the head, time was the head of Yablka, and who won with the, you know, the very Western-oriented um, uh, uh, political party at the time. And I mean, I, that really kind of stuck with me and of course, after Libya, as well in 2011, you know, Putin obviously is always of the, the mind that NATO is an adversary and is an opponent. But that um, concretizes that idea for many others as well. And we were not attuned enough to be constantly addressing that and constantly trying to you know, put it in a different frame. Yeah, or comments as well. I mean, I know that you've worked on uh, these issues as well, but um, yeah, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Thanks so much for the conversation. It was excellent. Uh, I have a question about sort of the gap between academia and policy world, in the sense that there's continued debate about the gap is there. And I'm wondering whether or not there's a gap to be filled at all, in the sense that in for the political scientists in the room, we <laughs> tend to do a lot of theorizing, right? Uh, we develop different kinds of models, bargaining models, crisis bargaining models, et cetera. And when it comes to international security studies in the policy world, uh, you, you have to deal with a lot of particular situations. So do you think there's a gap to be filled in the first place that basically academia doing a lot of theorizing social sciences in particular, and there's a policy world that deal with the particular situations and the issues? I think that there's definitely um, a gap to be filled there because I think it is very helpful for people to have different um, sets of frames. and. Um, you know, one of my positions, as uh, Dorothy mentioned, was at the National Intelligence Council, and actually part of the role as National Intelligence Officer, you know, it wasn't like being James Bond and you know, kind of, <laughs> it was all about analysis and trying to get different perspectives and different ways of looking at things. And we would bring in academics from all kinds of different backgrounds, and um, basically have debates about how we should be looking. Um, at various issues, and especially when you're dealing with conflict resolution, for example, or impending conflicts, thinking about game theory and you know zero sum and plus sum. You know, see, I don't know if you're actually working on, but it actually it is relevant. You know, and, and if you think about the work of you know my old professor Graham Allison about you know how he applied a lot of this to the Cuban Missile um, Crisis, you know, it is it is valuable. But it's it's trying to figure out how to kind of explain that to the layperson, uh, and 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 how these kind of frames can help you. Uh, think in uh, very particular sets of, uh, of circumstances. History is super relevant as well because um, we were ch chatting uh, about this, you know, over lunch, and I was talking to some students about it earlier. You know, a lot of people uh, in government are coming fresh to an issue as if it never existed before. Um, the previous president, you know, everything was a blank slate. 
And, you know, it's kind of it made, you know, it made advising absolutely impossible because there was no interest in the history. Why couldn't everything just start today mm -hmm. as if nothing had happened before? And that's not how the rest of the world is looking at things. I mean, you, you meet with some you know, world leaders and it's like they're still living in the 16th century. No joke. Vladimir Putin certainly Putin. is. Yep. Yeah. And, um, you know, or going back in the 10th century. 17th. 17th. The, okay, yeah, 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 the 17th. Yeah. But, but he <laughs> keeps going back to like 988 and, yep. the, you know, the, the uh, Christianized. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, even further back. But, you know, for example, um, uh, President Erdogan of Turkey, he would start every conversation somewhere in the Ottoman period. And, you know, you see everyone's eyes glazed over. Uh, and uh, it was kind of, but you'd have to explain it because he's making these references yeah. and everything would literally be lost in translation. And, it, and, it, and, it's, yes. and, it's also, and it also language is very important too because, uh, I mean, again, uh, the, the meaning uh, of, uh, you know, kind of a, of a word is often contextual, as we all know. I mean, there's all kinds of words that have shifted in their meaning over time in the English language, all kinds of terms you would use in the past you wouldn't use now. Uh, things that people, we all have all the time. Particularly in yeah. German. Yes, but also, you know, kind of in other languages too, you can give offence without meaning. We do it all the time in English, offend people because we're using terms that we shouldn't be, or that, 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 that for a generation or a different group means something. And then it's especially acute in international, you know, relations. And so we do need a lot more interface. I mean, sometimes it happens in um, think tanks because we have the revolving door, but, you know, it can... I would just encourage um, all of you to find ways uh, of engaging. And again, uh, the Mission Center taking people to, you know, kind of Washington DC, but at other, you know, places as well. Inviting, you know, public servants here. Um, people love to be invited to get out if they can. Uh, you know, working with, I mean, the State Department, the um, Intelligence and Research Bureau, the Office of the Historian. There's all kinds of different ways in which uh, universities can engage. And often now with, you know, the cuts of um, government budget, sometimes it might be better for, you know, universities to do some of that outreach as well. It's just not always thought of. I mean, some places think about it all the time, like the Kennedy School, Harvard, because, you know, I mean, I, I saw that, that, um, you know, many of the faculty there, they're just always constantly thinking about who they can get their paper to. Mm -hmm. And because they've been in and out of government, you know, they're, they're, they're always networking. But everyone else can do that as well. And it, so it's just a question of finding you know, the right interface. And, and also thinking about things like White House um, fellowships for faculty, the White House fellows, um, they're not always technical positions. I mean, uh, often, you know, you can also, uh, from other disciplines, uh, go and work for a period of time. Council on Foreign Relations uh, fellowships. I mean, of course, there's not lots of them available, but sometimes it's just kind of a, a question of knowing. And I think it actually helps with your own research and studies to have had a period of time. Brookings, we've got lots of... Um, uh, visiting fellowships, postdocs, pre, well, pre-docs, we haven't got some funding for, we're looking for it at the moment, but we've also got um, fellowships for, um, you know, a year or so, uh, uh, lots of other think tanks have as well. So I would encourage people to, you know, to think about those opportunities to bring the value of your knowledge uh, to other settings. Did you have a thought on the, the military um, aspect at all? Because I think, because uh, I was thinking about yeah. lunch, we, we didn't get a chance to uh, well, I thought your answer was great, but actually, since you're tossing it to me, building on that question, one thing I've been struggling with is thinking about the consistency in UN, U.S. foreign relations that we've seen roughly over time across administrations. And your uh, flippant remarks about the last president are something I think the world community has been looking at and now understands to be something fundamentally different, namely the express claims of any administration now are called into question longitudinally, right? Is there any way out of that box? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, look, it's a great question uh, because, I mean, you're right, there's a lot more, there's more continuity than change um, in yeah. American foreign policy. My um, old professor from, um, uh, the, the, uh, from Harvard, which I actually wrote to you about, Adam Ulam, had a whole yeah. book about continuity and change in Soviet foreign policy, but you could write that about any country. Because, you know, you, 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 uh, you operate within your own historical and geographic frame. You know, you've got, Canada and Mexico aren't going to disappear. Well, maybe, you know, but uh, we don't, at least they're probably not going to disappear, right, you know, kind of tomorrow. So we have the neighbours that we have. And other places have the neighbours that they have. And if you're living next to Russia, you know, you've got a kind of very different viewpoint from this. You're living, living next to Canada and Mexico, neither of which have invaded us for any period of, you know, time. We've been doing, you know more of expansion in you know, ourselves. So, you know, there's a, there's a very different context. Um, and, you know, I think that even with um, President Trump, there was actually kind of limits 
uh, to you know how much he actually changed, but the rhetoric changed, and some things did change on you know uh, some levels as well, pulling up and ripping up agreements and pulling out of things that had taken years to. Often though, he was doing it because he wanted his own agreement. It might have, it could have been the same agreement, but with his name all over it. Uh, so we used to joke about the super, uh, the START treaty. If it was super Trump arms regulation treaty, then uh, that would be fine. We could just, you know, kind of rename it and uh, move on. Sometimes he didn't. I mean, there was an actual play times when he had a total antipathy, uh, you know, to um, some of the agreements, the Paris um, Climate Accord, you know, being very clear. But it wasn't just him. But yes, I mean, that is now a major problem. And it's also with the congressional rhetoric and uh, the shift. So though, again, if you look at um, the foreign relations uh, committees on both the Congress and the Senate and you talk to the staffs, there's much more of bipartisan comedy and, again, more of a continuity. And the staffs tend to you know, keep things kind of regulated. There isn't a deep state, but there is actually a lot of, again, continuity because we have the same you know, sets of interests all the way along there. It's just how do we, I think it's the structure of the US political system that makes it most problematic. If you really think about it, the United States has more political appointments than any other country. So whenever we have um, a change in government, the number of positions that become political appointments, which is it's just, it actually beggars the imagination because there are so many um, also positions that are elected I mean, I was thinking about this when I just had the ballot for Maryland, where, you know, where I live. There was all these, you know, kind of ballot questions. I had no idea about them. I didn't even know they were on the ballot. I was asked to, um, you know, select the head for Howard County, I'm not even in Howard County, for the orphanage board. And I thought, the what? <laughs> and I, then I started thinking about little orphan Annie. And am I, you know, kind of, you know, writing away into kind of oblivion some, you know, poor children of orphanage by making this selection of these two people? I just left it blank. And then I thought, I'm leaving it blank. Who are these people? I didn't even know they were there. What if one of them's like, you know, kind of some horrible, you know, like Matilda or something, you know, kind of, you know, all these things go through your mind. I'm standing there over the ballot, just in complete confusion. But why is this on the ballot? Shouldn't this be somebody be properly selected and be appointed? And why didn't I know that it was on there? And what happens if nobody votes for them? And what happens if only two people vote for them? And that this person is on the Howard County Orphanage Board? I mean, that seems absurd. I mean, again, you know, we don't get on a, before we get on our plane, we don't elect our pilot, you know, or um, the, you know, the fire call up and ask, is this an elected official that's coming to get me? The fire chief, maybe, but is the, the guy, the head of the, you know, are they elected? I mean, are they appointed? Are they a Republican? Are they a Democrat? I mean, what does this mean? So some of the things that we actually do with America are actually kind of preposterous. Well, they, but they only look preposterous when you come in from the outside, from another country where there's just no way that you would, you would basically appoint all these people. Ambassadors, yeah. for example. Yeah, I mean, you want to, I mean, there's some of the students, I, I don't want to be mean about people individually, but the, um, some of the students told me at lunchtime that they'd um, met um, our former ambassador to the European Union had come to give a talk, uh, mm -hmm. the, the one that, you know, had a bit of a clash with uh, the millionaire who got kind of appointed, and they said he didn't talk about the European Union at all. Um, Probably you know, just well, as well, Fiona. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Probably, but, but the point is that, you know, when you have an ambassador to a place, you actually hope that they will know about the country. You know, some of our ambassadors, actually, political policies were actually fabulous, I have to say, just to, just to be also fair. But, but sometimes it's a bit of a, a crapshoot because it, it, if, it, if we're kind of doing it on the basis of political contributions or, you know, kind of because they have to, you know, fit a certain profile, we're not actually thinking about the job that they're actually doing here. And so part of the um, solution to the problem that you're talking about is just taking a really long, hard look at the way that we, you know, structure our government. Because we have so many positions in government that are never filled. I mean, I think we could sort of trace through multiple administrations, positions somewhere out there that probably have some relevance that have only been filled with by somebody acting and not having any kind of authority, plenipotentiary powers, probably through several administrations. And then, look, if you were in the military or you were, you know, kind of in a, in a hospital, it's actually why a lot of our hospitals have closed because you can't get staff in particular uh, positions. You know, th these things tend out to be disastrous, and sometimes they're disastrous in government as well. And, I mean, we do need some, you know, restructuring, and, but, but, you know, at the same time, we have to really, I think, think long and hard about how we conduct, you know, s ourselves in some of these capacities. In the United States... Um, you know, institutions that have been extraordinarily admirable, I have to say, but there are, you know, 
many cases where I think we need to lead a fresh look. I was worried in the National Security Council that you were, you know, losing a lot of the expertise each time. I mean, you obviously want it to reflect the, the president and whoever comes in and their political preferences, but you don't have to replace everybody. And, and the whole idea of people being detailed in was supposed to address that. But then if they're seen as holdovers in the previous president, irrespective of what their you know, political persuasion might be, and you're throwing them all out, you end up literally with people not knowing where the materials are, why the issues were, because you know the, the previous governments had come in and talked to you. And if you don't know the conversation that happened three months before, you know, you're really putting yourself at a disadvantage. Because that's why we always have a hard time dealing with the Russians, because they don't change anybody. Now, that's also a big problem. But we, we, have, to find a, we have to find a balance there. Because then they run circles around us. And that would you know, happen every single time we'd encounter you know, one of our more tricky international counterparts. So they, they already knew all the tricks. And they knew that we, you know, we didn't know, because we didn't have the memos from, from you know, the last lot. This has unfortunately uh, had to come to an end, but this has been a fantastic conversation mm -hmm. on the interplay of individuals and institutions, individuals who can disrupt a lot, individuals who can contribute a lot. Uh, but I think we've all been inspired by the reminder that government and civic associations and not least universities uh, have work that I suddenly feel inspired to go out and do. <laughs> so please thank our guest uh, and thank Thanks to Jeffrey and Thank you everyone.